trust in, my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me, yeah, I've decided I'm not giving up, cause you won't give up on me, you won't give up on me, your love is holding on and it won't let go, I feel it breaking out like an echo, your love is holding on and it won't let go, I feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. Every season, you keep repeating promises to me. Whoa, now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete. And when my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. Yeah, I've decided. praise this morning. Amen. The atmosphere is changing now. For the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. We have a new song this morning. It's called Here as in Heaven. And as you just heard, the verse says that the atmosphere is changing now for the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. And this morning, I want to remind all of us that we have power in the words that we speak. The Bible says there's power, there's life and death in the tongue. So if we would choose life to speak truth, to speak His promises, we can see the atmosphere change around us. The heavens will join with us in our prayers, in our praises. 
to bring forth his kingdom on this earth. Amen. So as we go into this song, let's really dedicate our hearts to the God who deserves all our praise and to honor him and to worship him with the truth through faith in Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this together. We're going to sing the atmosphere is changing. Let's declare this. The atmosphere is changing now. Come on, let's speak life. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. Sing the evidence. The evidence is all around. That the Spirit of the Lord is here. Sing overflow. Overflow in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. We speak, we speak life. Let's sing this again from the top. The atmosphere. The atmosphere is changing now. For the spirit, for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence, the evidence is all around. That the Spirit of the Lord is here to overflow in this place. Fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love.
miracle can happen now for the spirit of the Lord is here the evidence is all around for the spirit of the Lord is shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May he give you peace. May he give you peace. Let's sing that. The Lord bless you and keep Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's agree in prayer. And verse again. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give Help us to go beyond ourselves, Lord God, and to share that love unto others, God. To bless those that need you. Let us not get trapped in only looking at ourselves, but God, to remember that you gave us the good news so that we could share it with others, God. Help us to be a people that think generationally, God. That think of those around us, God. Those that are destined to perish right now, but God, let us reach deep down and in our prayer and in our praise, God, cry out for those souls to find truth and to find healing, to find salvation and freedom in you, God. We have that truth. We have that healing. We have that peace, God. So let us go beyond ourselves, Lord God, to be filled up and then to fill others, God. For you are worthy, God. And we trust in your promises this morning. We love and adore you, God. And we worship because you are worthy of our praise, God. Simply because you are worthy of our praise. You are good. You are mighty. You are loving. You are kind. And we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and their children and their children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going you're weeping, rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. Come on, declare that. He is for you. 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 against us. Thank you for your presence now. You're refreshing now. God, we are so grateful to experience you in this way. God, continue to prepare our hearts. God, as we just got intimate with you, allow, God, the things that do not belong to be separated for that which does. God, minister to us today. God, thank you for just being the light to this world. God, in dark times, you are light, and we are so grateful for who you are. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And we all said, church family, amen and amen. Woo! All right, church. Well, before you have your seats, let's give those that are around us the peace sign. Say, hey, how's it going? You can wave it back and forth. Thank you. So great to see all of you live and in person. We appreciate you joining us today. For those of you online, thank you for tuning in. We would love for you to be able to continue to connect with us. You'll be able to see a slide up there about next steps, real easy way of texting us to be able to connect. It's a great opportunity for you to be able to, um, you know, just find out more about who we are as a church or find out what your next step may be. Um, there's a few things that I want to be able to highlight for us today of upcoming events. We know we're going into the holidays. We know that it's a could be a very stressful time. You know, society kind of says that holidays, right, are really those 
fun times to be around family, but also very stressful, all the shopping and all that. Hopefully we'll do a lot of online shopping this time instead of in-person shopping. Um, but what I want, the, the date that I want us to kind of get in our head is December 3rd. Does anyone know what day December 3rd is? Thursday, Thursday, prayer. Yeah, we're connecting the dots, right? So great opportunity for us to be able to, especially right now where we're at um, as a society and as, even in Hawaii, right? We're kind of in a, in, in a moment where we're coming out of this pandemic, hopefully. And so we want to be able to stand in agreement with each other as a church and just believe for better things, for new things, for more creativity, for just the ability to see this pandemic just go away. And so we're having it here December 3rd, 6 a.m. to 7. So here at YWCA, we'd love to be able to connect with you. We'll all be social distance um, in the location that we are here at YWCA. The other thing, the other date, like we saw, like we sang about today um, at the very end about generations and generations is December 6th. Can you all say that with me? December 6th. What's going on December 6th? Anyone know? A few of you may know we're having another outdoor service. So the feedback we got from our last, last outdoor service was thank you so much for being able to have a moment like this where we're outside and it was the first time for a few of you in this room to be able to come back to service. And so we wanna just repeat that same thing, have a great little celebration. We're gonna be talking about family on that day. It's gonna be like a family service. You may even see some, um, some special guests that are a little younger singing or sharing on stage. So even people that are gonna be greeting will all kinda have a great opportunity for our families to be able to do it together. So it's gonna be a family service. We're gonna have a, a great treat afterwards for us to be able to still can continue to connect. Well, um, our series, we're in part four right now called No Matter What. And this title uh, for this, this, this week is Love Your Enemies. Yeah, should be a lot of fun. And here to bring that word is our very own Pastor Tim Ma. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, Pearlside Church. All right, it's a cold morning in here. In fact, Ethan, can you do me a favor and point that fan away? Because you might see me just like freeze up. And I, I'm like freezing in here, thank you. Um, I will dress more appropriate next week Sunday, but you know, the blessing is when it's cold like this, it's hard to fall asleep. So either my preaching is going to be really bad if I see any of you sleeping or you're dressed really warm, in which case we're going to have ushers um, ask you to take off your jacket so you stay awake. No, just kidding. We won't do that here. Maybe it's the Lord putting you in a trance because you're seeing visions. But um, welcome to Pearlside Church, whether you're joining us online or you're here in person. Uh, I see some new faces or faces that we haven't seen in a bit, so welcome back. So excited to have you here uh, live worshiping in person. And the great thing about the presence of God is that he's not contained in just the building. So even where you're at, our prayer is that God will be touching your heart and filling you with his presence as well. As Mark said earlier, we are in a current series called No Matter What. And in uncertain times like this that we're living in, we can be certain that we have a God, that he is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. And so we have this firm foundation that we place our faith on. And when everything else is so unstable in society, maybe even unstable in our own hearts or in our own households, thank God we have a God that we can depend on no matter what. And so the overarching premise this past month in November that we've been looking at is that no matter what, God is in control. No matter what, God is sovereign, meaning he's over all things. And then this idea of allowing God to be in, in control, we last week started off with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, uh, just for us to understand how important the, this, this group of teachings that he gave here in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, some people call it the, the constitution of the kingdom of God. It's very declarative that this is, you know, when you're in the kingdom of God as a citizen of, of the heavens and the citizen and a son of God, a daughter of God, this is a characteristics of how you live. And, and so last week we talked about the initial part. Well, this week, it's such a big topic, we are now just going to focus on this one specific thing about loving your enemies. Because 
loving your enemies is such a contrast in what we see in the world. We live in a very divisive society right now. Um, from, you know, it's like you can't even say who you voted for, whether you voted for Biden, Biden or Trump, uh, even locally. Uh, I don't know who you voted for, for all the local seats that were up. But you, you feel like if you say who you voted for, you might get attacked for it. And you very well might be, because we are in a very politically charged climate that we're in. Um, there's a lot of uh, racial uh, injustice going on, and because of that, that's caused a very uh, volatile climate in that regards as well. And so everywhere, right, uh, we're parents, teachers and schools, even that is a very stressful time. So everywhere you look, um, it's, it's just such an intense time that it's this saying about loving your enemies, it's more important than ever. And as the people of God, we don't just do good things because we're Christians, but we allow the Holy Spirit to come and transform us because of who he is, because of his presence, because of his spirit. And for that to happen, we look at his word. His word is the living, breathing word of God. And as we get into his word, the very breath of God can fill us if we allow his words to do that. So today we're going to look at Luke chapter 6, and we're going to turn to verse 27. going to follow along with me. We have the scriptures on screen. It says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would and have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Let's open up in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we are not here to just feel good and to feel good about ourselves or to get a new perspective and how we can feel good about life. We are here to be transformed. And so we pray, Lord God, even in the hearing of your word, that your perfect work, Lord, would happen inside each and every one of the hearers of your word this morning. And we pray, Lord God, that you bless the sermon, as difficult as it may be for some to receive this word. It's not an opinion, but this is your truth, and your truth can transform. So we pray that you have your way, and may you be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So from this passage, the first thing we see is that loving God requires loving our enemies as well. And if we revisit our opening verse, verse 27, Jesus right off the bat says, but to you who are listening, so make sure your neighbor is listening. And if you're at home, you better not have NFL football next to the screen watching me right now. So to you who are listening, pay attention. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. And when First John, it, it gives a, a, another explanation of what that looks like in loving your enemies. Chapter 4 says, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us that commandment. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. 
So we're going to break it down here. Uh, if you're a Christian in here, I, there's not one of you in here that says that you wouldn't love God, that you don't love God, right? If we went line by line and had you come up on stage and say, do you love God? You would say, yes, I love God. That's why you're in church here, right? Um, seekers, we, we pray that you will learn to love God and learn more, more importantly that God loves you. But for those of us who are committed to God, there's none of us who say, I'm a Christian, but I don't love God. But yet, how many Christians choose to not forgive and not love their enemies? Because for Jesus, here in this teaching and what we read in the writings of 1 John, they go hand in hand. They're inseparable. They're two sides of the same coin. That you cannot say you love God, but you hate somebody in your life. And the thing is, many of us, we wouldn't say, oh, I hate that person, right? Because that sounds so extreme. But yet, our actions maybe uh, speak differently of that. And, um, you know, I, I have four kids. And someone that says, oh, yeah, you know, I'm your friend, Tim. I love you. But if you tr mistreat my children, that would, that would ruin our relationship. I can tell you that. Our relationship would need to be reconciled. And the truth is that the people all around you and the people in the world and the people that you see in the news that maybe get your blood boiling, God created them. God created them in his image. And so even though they're living a life of sin, nonetheless, they are still created as sons and daughters of God. For them, there's an opportunity for them to get right with God. And so he sees them as his creation and his children. And so for us to hate a brother or sister, in other words, to hate people around us, then we cannot in the same breath say we love God. And so right off the bat, the gauntlet is thrown down. It's like, what do we do? Because the thing is, I think we struggle with this idea of being able to love our enemies because we often equate, and especially in our English culture here, where we don't have many different ways to describe the word love, and we just have one word, love, right? You can say, oh, I love my cats, and then I love to eat um, pizza, I love to eat cheeseburgers, right? It's like all unhealthy stuff. What, 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 what food, my kids will say they love boba milk tea, Right, And then in the next breath, oh, I love boba milk tea. Oh, I love you, Dad. Thank you for buying me that boba milk tea. It's like, is that the same thing? That, that love that you have, the affinity and the affections towards boba milk tea, is that how you love your family? No, there's a different level, right? And in the Greek uh, language in which the New Testament was written, this love that Jesus is using is agapeo or agape love. And that is an unconditional love. And it's the ultimate expression of love in which we see and which Jesus demonstrated for us as he died on the cross for us. So this love is not the romantic, warm, fuzzy feeling love. So when we say love your enemies or when Jesus or God says love your enemies, he's not saying, hey, we got to be buddy buddies with them and, and, and feel all good about them and how they hurt us and mistreat us and betrayed us. It's not talking about feelings. It's talking about a position and a choice of choosing to unconditionally, no matter what they do, for us to continue to love them. And, and so how do we do that? Well, that's the, the idea is it's not just our attitude, that I'm going to have an attitude and choose to love them, but it's also through our actions. And that's why if we go back to verse 27 once more, Jesus gives us the blueprint. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. That sounds uh, unintuitive, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't do good to those who hate you. In fact, many of us, we, we do the opposite. We start plotting how we can get them back. We start plotting how we can take revenge, right? You take my parking spot, okay, just wait. You get in there first, but, you know, when I walk past your car, if my key accidentally goes across your car, you know, that's your fault that your car took my spot. Shh. It's like, oh, Pastor Tim. No, I, 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 that's hypothetical. That never happened in my life before. <laughs> 
And, and so this idea, love your enemies, but do good to those um, that, that are your enemies. Like it's this, it's this attitude and the actions also represent this posture of love. So we don't have to like them. We don't have to want, have warm, fuzzy feelings towards them. But what we do in expressing that love needs to be demonstrated. So what does that look like? Well, we practically love our enemies by praying for them. This is first and foremost what we see. And if the very next verse, verse 28, and I love scripture, right? It's, it's not just this theoretical idea, but then Jesus is breaking it down for us practically. In verse 28, he says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. I believe in the power of prayer. I've seen prayer heal my mom of cancer. And I also believe prayer can change the heart of your enemies. It's possible. Prayer can change people. But more importantly, here's here's what happens when we pray. Prayer doesn't just change them. Prayer changes us. And that's why Jesus is telling us to pray for them. Because there's something about when we first act in faith, then the emotions and the feelings follow. It's first a step of faith. And when we pray for people, we're saying, God, I trust you. And I'm handing them over to you. But it's not even just praying, oh God, help me forgive them. Or God, help them stop being such a jerk. You know those those passive aggressive prayers? Hopefully husbands and wives, you never prayed that before with one another. Right? You're like, honey, let's pray. God, help my wife be more patient and understanding. And you know, you just, the list goes on and on. And be more loving, help her cook better. (laughs) It's like, oh, slap. Turn the other cheek, right? It's not those passive aggressive prayers, but Jesus specifically says, bless those who curse you. So you're praying for the benefit, the good, the goodwill, you know, believing for the goodness of God to come upon them. Even though they're believing for bad things to happen to you, you're gonna believe the opposite. And when I got became a Christian back as a teenager, um, Right off the bat, like what drove me to church, okay, I was interested in knowing more about God. I was really fascinated with this Pearlside Church and how young people were coming and worshiping God. What's up with that? That drew me in as a 15-year-old. But what also drew me in, confession time, was a girl. Oh, she goes? Oh, for sure I'm there. She goes to Pearlside? Okay, I'm there, I'm there, you know? And uh, the land of milk and honeys, right? And sorry, bad joke. (laughs) And so I went, and I was like, okay, yeah, she's there. She's worshiping. I'm going to worship too. And then, and then we got to know each other. I asked her out. She said yes. We're going out. But then I have one of my good friends um, talking to her more than she was talking to me, and we're officially boyfriend-girlfriend. And then a month later into our, you know, boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, she's like, oh, I'm going to break up with you. You guys know what's going to happen next, Right? A few days later, like two, three days later, my friend pulls up to my house. And he's like, I just want to let you know, I'm going to start going out with your ex-girlfriend. And I would see her in church worshiping. Like, put down your hands. You ain't holy. What are you doing? You know? But, 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 thank God for the word of God transforming me. And, like, keep in mind, I just got saved. I'm a baby Christian. I'm like f- several months in the Lord just walking with him. But, but fortunately, this truth here, as I was reading scripture, this is one of the first things I read in the Bible. And I started to pray for them. God, bless their relationship. Let their relationship be fruitful. I started praying for their goodness, you know, for the outcome, for good things to happen to them. And you know what was amazing? All that bitterness, that anger, the hardness that was in my heart. Because I didn't allow that to consume me and fill my heart, but rather I was giving that to God, then it gave room for God to give me his peace. He gave room to God to give me his joy. And I was like, wow, I was so mad. I was depressed. Like all these feelings when someone betrays you, you know, um, one of my best friends and this girl that I was into, that's, that's two people betraying me and filling my heart with all this animosity towards them. But as I began to pray for them, God did a mighty work in my life. And here's the greatest thing. 
is that, you, you know, you look at me up here and you're like, wow, you know, Pastor Tim, like you're, 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 you're a pastor now, you know, you're doing all this for the kingdom of God. And I think back in my life for these kind of opportunities that God has allowed in my life to get to know him. It's not so much that it's because like I study the scriptures so amazingly, I'm up here, I'm preaching to you. But it's because I allowed God to work his truth in my heart. And one of the greatest opportunities was to be able to do that, to love my enemies, to pray for my enemies. Because from there, I realized, man, this God that I committed my life to, what's happening in my life right now is supernatural. There's no other way to explain it except for the perfect work of the Holy Spirit working inside of me that has transformed me like this. This is amazing. And so that propelled my faith to new levels and gave me the momentum that I needed to continue to serve him all the days of my life. Moments like that, loving my enemy. So this is the, the very first step, but yet it's such a critical step that we cannot skip. That we don't just pray, God, send fire upon them, let them go bankrupt, let them come down with diseases. No, it doesn't say curse those who curse you, but bless those who bless you. And watch God move. The next thing is not retaliating because of their actions. So we looked at verse 27, 28. Now read with me once more verse 29. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn, the, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. This is pretty extreme. And, and Jesus, during that time, as he's speaking to his people, I mean, you know, it sounds like hyperbole now, but back then, this is a literal thing because they were under the rule of Roman oppression, the Roman government. There were times where the Roman soldiers would just come and because they saw themselves as superior to the Jewish people, you would just get hit for no reason or things were taken from you and over taxation, all, all types of unfairness and injustice was happening. And so... People were waiting for this savior to come, to be like a conquering king, to throw off this oppression. But yet, Jesus comes and brings a different kind of kingdom. He brings the truth of the kingdom of God. And we call it an upside-down kingdom. Because instead of fighting back, he says, turn the other cheek. And why? Why would God say that? It doesn't, it, it, again, it seems counterintuitive, right? Um, when, you get, when you get hit in the face... Most of us, naturally, we, we want to hit back. You know, in um, 14 years of marriage now, you guys hear me share my adventures with my wife. And I think one of the biggest problems we had when we first got married, um, and, and one of my good friends said this, right? Getting married is like sleeping with your enemy and waking up next to your enemy every morning. <laughs> and it's, sometimes that can be really true, right? Like the person that causes you most angst and pain in your life can be your, your most uh, closest people in your life, your loved ones, your child, or your spouse. And, you know, I had to learn the hard way. Like when I first got married, it was, I don't know why, sometimes things were coming out of my mouth and it's almost like the matrix, it's like slow motion. You are, you know, like, why am I saying this? Like, this is just going to make things worse. And I retaliate. If she, uh, if I feel attacked or insulted or I feel hurt, instead of forgiving her or loving my wife, I then come back with another attack. Well, you don't do this. And then she comes back. Well, you're like this. And then I come back. And it's like we're trading blows verbally. And so this idea of turning the other cheek, you know, many of us, we don't get into physical confrontations, which is a good thing, right? It's good. We don't have to walk around with, like, our brass knuckles and, like, like watching every corner, like, we, we run, go around. Uh, if that's the case, you need to probably find a new place to live or work. Um, but most of us aren't in that kind of a physical, hostile environment. However, many of us, we can be in, in environments where we feel attacked, our pride feels insulted, we could feel bombarded with things that are unfair. And when that happens, Jesus is saying, turn the other cheek. When something's taken from us, we don't try to take it back. We say, oh, what else do you want? <laughs> and that's just mind-blowing. Why would God say this? Well, Romans 12 also gives us uh, further um, details on, on what this looks like. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. 
For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So the reason why God says this is because we are not God. And because we are not God, we are not the judge. And sometimes in our self-righteousness, we think, I am right, and I have every right to retaliate with what I'm going to do or what I'm going to say. And how many of us, if we are honest with ourselves, we take a step back and we're like, man, there are times where I thought I was so right and I was so certain, but yet, after that, some details emerge, and I realize I wasn't as right as I thought I was. But yet in our haste, in that moment of self-righteousness and anger, looking at that other person, we maybe then said things or did things we later regretted. And maybe you are right. Maybe it's not even because you misconstrued the facts and you don't have the whole context. Maybe you are right in a particular situation. Doesn't matter. You are not God. God is the one that says, I will be judge and I will allow justice to come forth but here's the thing about God's justice it doesn't happen in our timing many of us we want justice in that right very rightful moment right when someone hurts us we want to say God strike them down right now be judge and jury right execute them but God doesn't operate like that and we get frustrated but just let's let's place ourselves in the other person's shoes we're the ones that did wrong How many of us are grateful that God didn't strike us down in that very moment? When we're the ones, we were being the jerk. We're the ones that was very selfish and did something that hurt somebody else. But he bought us time to repent. He bought us time to get right. And so that that perspective helps us in that moment when we desire mercy and grace, when we wronged others, we are grateful for that. So when people wrong us, we got to be grateful that God is perfect and his timing is perfect and we trust in that. But it's not just not retaliating. Now we go one step further. We also do good. (laughs) So it's praying for them, not retaliating, but not just retaliating. Instead of giving you a punch, I'm going to give you some love. I'm going to do good to your life. I'm going to bless you. So verse 35 says, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. As we look at Romans 12, 20, it says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not over, uh, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Um, having four kids in the house, I wish they could live out this passage. Because every time something happens, whether uh, a, a kid sits on another kid by accident on the couch, all of a sudden, like, kicks and punches start flying. You know, returning evil with evil. And nothing good ever results from that. And I, I am always, you know, as a father coming in, I'm trying to separate them. I'm like, one of you need to start first with loving the other person. Because right now, when you kick and you hit each other back, that's only going to make the other person want to hit them back until one of you guys are going to get so hurt that you can't hit each other back, right? And, and the, the craziest thing is it's usually my four-year-old. She's a girl. She's like the tiniest because I have an 11, um, soon-to-be 10-year-old next week, and then an eight-year-old who's a boy, and then my four-year-old. And it's the eight-year-old and the four-year-old it's like a UFC match every day in our house. Like, I got videos I can show you if you think I'm making this up. <laughs> and so it's my, my son, right? He's the one that's older and bigger. And I'm, I'm always looking at him first. Like, son, you are more stronger than her. You can't hit her back like that. You got to protect your sister, love your sister, even if she hurts you. Because if you hurt her, she's going to just try to hurt you back. You got to do good to her so she understands that you love her. And so for us, as people of God in the world, God is saying the same thing to us. Son, daughter, even though there's other people outside of this church hurting you, or maybe even people within the church hurting you, you need to do good to them. Because when you do, you're honoring me as your heavenly father. When you obey and you trust me in my justice. 
Because this truth we close with is that, and Ethan, you can come up. Jesus loved us while we were still his enemies. Verse 35 to 36 says that, Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful as your Father is merciful. So when we live lives that reflect mercy to others, we live lives that reflect God's nature and love to others. Because ultimately, that's what life is about. We are created to glorify God. And glorifying God can sometimes sound like this heavy religious sounding word, glory, right? And it's like, what does it mean to glorify God? Well, to put it in simple terms, to glorify God means to simply reflect the image of God. All of our lives, not just while we're in church, do we glorify God with our worship. You are holy, you are great. We're glorifying him as we declare his majesty, we declare his power. But we glorify him even in the way we respond to others, when they mistreat us, when they hurt us, when they take from us. And we reflect to them the mercy of God. We reflect to them the love of God. We are glorifying God. We get to show the world who God is. And we get to show the world that God's love is real. Because only a supernatural love of God can transform us in our physical and our natural pain to allow people to see, wow, this God must be real. You know, if you go in uh, North America, you drive around our, our continent, in many neighborhoods, there's a street named after this man. And we also have a national federal holiday celebrating this man's birthday and legacy. His name is Martin Luther King Jr. I'm going to show a picture to you. Uh, he's the leader of the civil rights movement. And how did, how did he bring about such great change? This, this time where... Uh, racial segregation was legalized in the South. You know, people had to take different buses to schools and even attend different schools. People were mistreated. How did he bring about change? Well, Dr. Martin Luther King was more than just a doctor. He's a reverend. He's a man after God's own heart. He was a man that lived and studied God's word and allowed God's word to be demonstrated through his life. And this is such a powerful picture here because there's this burning cross in his front yard. You can see his son with him. And as a father, I would be outraged. You would do this in front of my house, jeopardizing my family, bringing this kind of filth into my own house, my own yard. But he comes out after the cross is done burning. He pulls it out and he begins to pray for those that put the cross in his front yard, he begins to pray, God, bless them. Draw them close to you. And there's this powerful quote that I'm going to read to you, to you from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it's such a powerful quote because it has the truth of God within it as he saturated himself with the word of God. He says this, the ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you cannot murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate, so it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. And darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. As the worship team comes up, we close with Romans 5, 10. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son.
the most powerful thing about loving our enemies is because that is exactly what happened to us. We allow the gospel to be demonstrated through our lives, not just with our words, but with our heart and with our action, our attitude and our actions, agape love. That Jesus, when he died for us, it wasn't at a point when we were worshiping him and we loved him and we made ourselves right with him. He died for us while we were still his enemies. Let's rewind 2,000 years ago. While he hung on the cross, he even prayed for us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He didn't pray, Father, get me down from here so I can take revenge on all these people that have betrayed me, that have hurt me. He was innocent, yet he was beaten, he was flogged. At any moment, he could have called angels down to defend him, to show his his righteousness. But yet he let God and his perfect timing, his perfect will played out. And because of that, we now are offered an extended eternal life. We now can have the power of the Holy Spirit to come inside of us and transform us. And so when we love our enemies we allow the gospel to play out over and over and over again to all come and see and know that god is love and that he is the only god let's all stand to our feet i'm going to pray for us and then we're going to go into a, a moment of worship as a response to ask the holy spirit to come and change our hearts Some of us right now, we struggled with this message because we are facing some very real enemies in our life, uh, specific names, faces that have really betrayed us and hurt us, come against us, oppose us, and we get anxiety just even thinking about coming back into the work week because we're going to see them again, or going home and seeing them in our house or in our neighborhood. And so we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts so we can love them, we can pray for them, we can bless them. But there's some of us in here too that we heard this message and it's a good message, but we really, we right now in our lives uh, don't have any enemies. Everything is good. But we're still gonna allow the Holy Spirit, I wanna encourage you, allow the Holy Spirit to work his truth in your heart because that way when when someone does strike you in the near future or farther ahead, you're ready because the word is guarding you. So we're gonna allow the word to be a shield inside of us as we allow his work to be established in our hearts. So Father God, as we enter back into worship, Lord, we pray that you would have your way. We pray our feelings right now, Lord, would not dictate, Lord, our faith, but rather let it be the opposite way around. We choose to rise up in faith. We choose to love our enemies. We choose to be people of love that demonstrate your love. We thank you, God. We worship you. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done here as in heaven. Sing that again, Spirit. As you ask God to fill your heart with his love, allow him to take away any animosity, bitterness, 
hatred, anger you have towards anyone or people group, maybe it's a political party, whoever it is, let God take that away from you so that you have room to allow God to fill you with His love. Believe that He's surrounding you with His presence. Praise you, Lord. Let's just all have a moment right now with the presence of God here, his love surrounding us, guiding us, leading us forward out of this position of anger towards our enemies and wanting to maybe even retaliate. God brought you here for a reason. His timing is perfect. And I want you, for those of us who have any specific people group, any individual or family in mind to pray for them right now. They may have caused you harm. They may have caused you angst. They may have taken something from you, but I want you to forgive them right now. I want you to love on them and even ask God to bless them. Ask God to draw them near to him. Ask God to allow them to come to know you more. Father God, we repent, Lord. Sometimes we take this passage of scripture, your teaching as optional. I can love God and be faithful in church, be a good Christian in all these other areas, but this one area I'm just gonna put as a suggestion about loving my enemies. But no, your word clearly says that you cannot say you love God but hate your enemies. And so, Lord God, we don't want that to separate ourselves from your perfect love. So we pray in this holy moment, draw us near to you. May your love transform our heart. May your love transform any hatred we have towards someone else into love for them that you showed us, Lord God, agape love. And we thank you for that, that perfect love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise this morning. Praise God. You may be seated. You know, and as you are seated, I know this teaching sometimes can get misconstrued and, and, and sometimes it's difficult to follow because we think, okay, turn the other cheek. Um, and so we, we leave ourselves in abusive situations, whether it's in the workplace and maybe God's opening up another opportunity for us to get a new job, right? But we, we stay there because Jesus has turned the other cheek. But he doesn't say, but stay in that position of harm. You can turn the other cheek and be wise and get yourself out of that situation. And that is especially true if it's physical abuse. You know, whether it's in your very own household, it's turn the other cheek, but go get help. Turn the other cheek and make sure you get yourself out of that situation, out of wisdom and safety. So I just want to make that clear as well, because sometimes it's like, oh, I can't obey it because that doesn't make sense. And, but we take that one part, we get hold up on that one little uh, caveat, but the overall truth is it's about demonstrating God's love to others. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Tim. I know that definitely ministered to me, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, church, just as a reminder or just even encouraging all of us, maybe we, you need prayer in this time. And it's very easy. You can text 33777. We'll be able to connect with you and stand with you. If this is something that's a really heavy weight on you, we want to help lighten the load or allow God to lighten that, that burden on you. Amen. Church, if we can, let's uh, also continue with a heart of worship and bless our tithes and offering. Join with me as we pray. God, thank you so much for your generosity, God. You are such a generous God. You always provide God, and in moments like we're in now, God, we seek your provision. We seek your face, God, and we thank you for the season that we're in. 
God, we also thank you for allowing as we give to just bless it and multiply it and allow it to just do greater things. God, allow as we give to give vision to others and allow it to be able to inspire and change and go forth. God, bless this tithe now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Church, just to continue to remind us of um, how thankful or how thankful we can be in this pandemic, we have a short video clip. I'll let you take a look. COVID time, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty tough. Kind of, kind of a roller coaster. A lot of ups and downs, but during the whole entire pandemic, God has been working in and through me. 2020 has been really rough for me. Then you start questioning, what, what am I doing with my life? You know? 2020 has been tough. for God showing his presence in my life. So thankful that God has revealed to me that there's just so much purpose. I think family is the most important. One thing I'm thankful for actually is to be able to share the gospel with my friends, even during this COVID season, um, and being able to come here. I'm thankful for a friendship because um, God knows just the right people to place in your life when you need them the most. Well, I'm really thankful to be in the presence of the Lord, being healthy, you know, being able to come to church with my grandchildren. So many things to be thankful for and to be healthy. These difficult times, I was able to draw closer to God because of the church. For my friends like Loyalyn and Jamari and helping me get closer to God. To have my family around. My mom, uh, because She's a superhero in my eyes. So my real family, my church family. You know, it's, it's shaped and molded me to be the person that I am today. I'm really thankful for my brother Paul and Travis and all the other guys in my small group. Shout out to you guys. Especially hard times as this where it's very hard to trust God. Um, continue leaning on to him because he is not done with you and he will not give up on you or forsake you. Just because this pandemic has taken away a lot of things, God has given us many things and abundant things. So let's continue to look forward and have faith no matter what happens, especially during this time. COVID time, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty tough. Kind of, kind of a roller coaster. A lot of ups and downs. Um, what, a, what a great clip just to... Re renew our perspective, as, especially as we head into Thanksgiving. Um, some of us were maybe upset or not happy that, you know, we can't have the normal gatherings that we're used to having. Maybe it's tradition, and this is the, the first year in many years that we're going to break this tra tradition of having certain families or people over. But here's the great news is that throughout this pandemic, um, and it's a miraculous move of God that the church has been able to be open, you know, despite restrictions that we had. And so this is, we see this as spiritual family. And so maybe your family, you know, your extended family might not be able to gather together like you're accustomed to, but the house of God remains open for those to come and, and celebrate Thanksgiving weekend together. So I, I call it a pandemic hacks, right? You just find different ways to do what you normally used to do in just a different form. So I know this is not good. we're not going to have turkey and gravy and, and all that, the fix-ins here next week's service, unless Mark decides to buy us some. <laughs> no, we won't have that. However, we have the word of God, which is more important, right? Because you go hungry after turkey, because you can make turkey sandwiches after, but that will run out. But the word of God is eternal. And so I want to encourage you, next weekend, you know, if, you, if there's family that you're used to seeing here on the island that aren't able to get together because of the limit of restrictions, how many people can gather, they can gather here together. You can see them and celebrate Thanksgiving in a different way. So just, so, just a thought to keep in mind, uh, and, and those of you who are watching too, uh, for you to come and, and worship God together here as we express gratitude to God and watch God do an amazing thing in our hearts as we come. Well, as you leave today, know that you are part of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is mercy, love, and forgiveness. So may that be exemplified through your life and all your relationships. God bless you. Thank you for coming.